matter how how do we avoid such you know uh, irregular expenditures? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, one would think. I mean, it's been thirty years of democracy. We would have had a bit of grasp of um, you know good governance. Yeah. yeah. So you've got to put in place disciplined management practices. And the only way you do that, and that must happen for every institution, the only way you do that in our analysis and our experience is by ensuring that there is a leadership team that has competence, that has the right posture in terms of ethical conduct, that is given the space to do their work without undue interference, and that is also held accountable. Um, One doesn't expect perfection in all transactions, but there must be accountability and there must be a willingness and a posture that says we we, we have an ongoing process of improving our internal controls. Yes, you might get one tender wrong, but there shouldn't be a repeat. And if you're not monitoring, if these institutions are not being monitored on a regular basis, as the design of the governance processes actually demands, um, then these transactions that are problematic go on for years mm. without any real accountability, without any real course correction. And by the time you try and catch the issue, it's quite late, there's been significant leakage. So our view, Ajiga, it remains that we've got to have a professional public service where those that run, our, those that are appointed to run public institutions have competence, they have the right ethical posture and that they're given the space to do their work and they must be held accountable held accountable by those that supervise them directly, being the executive, but also held accountable by the oversight mechanisms in parliament and the, in, in the legislatures. If we get every one of those players doing their part as designed, we will start to have fewer and fewer transgressions because you have a culture and a process where things get picked up and they get course corrected mm-hmm. um, and there isn't so much license for wrongdoing. What you've seen in each of these municipalities where there's coalition governments and there's significant instability at the council level is that it does translate into instability at the administration and it does translate into um, the loss of capability that may have been established in the past. And capability talks to can they actually do what they're supposed to do. How much have you done in Mm -hmm. terms of your office, Mm -hmm. you know, having those referrals mm. to try and correct what um, you know um, systematic mm-hmm. problems that simply just continue yeah. unabated yeah I mean so you're quite right to reflect on the powers that we have simply put those powers give us the authority and the responsibility to follow up on whether or not our audit recommendations are being followed up and implemented by the accounting officer. So the person appointed to run that institution, because we don't take over the role of the people managing the institution. And ours, the process runs like this. So we audit, we complete, we give the the finding to say, in this particular transaction, there is urgency in terms of what you need to fix. And you must fix it according to your given responsibility. So as HOD, as the board, as the CEO, as, as, as the DG, you're still responsible for investigating to understand what really happened, for um, uh, reporting matters to law enforcement if the case requires so, for stemming the loss by cancelling contracts, by getting money back, by um, disciplining your staff, training your staff, whatever is applicable in that particular instance, you have a duty to, to implement. So ours is to follow up on whether or not you've done it. It's only if they fail to do, to do what they're supposed to do that we will then implement our powers. And our powers start off with a referral for investigation and a recommendation, which is a much stronger recommendation in the audit report. Again, if they still fail to implement those things, then we we can take binding remedial action, which is reviewable in the court of law, and then we can issue a certificate of death. Now, this process takes time because its design follows the design of our public finance management processes, which says, those that are appointed to manage must still manage. So we don't take over the role, we just simply follow up. So it's a complementary mechanism. Over time, what we've seen is, is much improved responsiveness. Um, we're finding that those that run public institutions more readily respond to our MI than the normal audit finding. So they apply greater urgency. <laughs> So over time, we've seen, we've been able to um, have our own processes result in the protection of resources. We're now tracking just over 2 billion rand, if I look at those cycles, 
of resource protection that has come through the work of the AGSA. The loss is much greater than that. It's about 12 <coughs> billion. So it was 14 billion at last count. Yeah. Now, if you look at the difference between what has been lost from the transactions we've picked up on, because remember, we don't audit every single transaction. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's been lost and what's been recovered, um, there's quite a big gap. Mm -hmm. What that tells you is yes, we as AJSA have used our powers to good effect and we continue to do so, but our mechanism cannot be the sole adequate remedy to the issues around resource protection, efficiency of spend. You've got to get people who are running these institutions to do what they're supposed to do. I think all of us learned a few things out of the, the COVID era. So we did real-time audits in COVID, which means you audit almost as soon as the transaction has happened, right? Um, for the floods, what we had learned as an audit office was to remain proximate to the people that were running institutions. Um, and to remind them of their obligations in terms of safeguarding resources. So yes, be efficient and responsive, but you have to still maintain proper financial management disciplines and because you must still be accountable and transparent around how you spend funds. We found that not only had we learned, but our auditees had learned. Um, we found that the accounting officers and a number of departments and entities took had taken our initial messages to heart and they put, they put controls in place. Notably, in KZN, the provincial treasury put particular controls in place that had internal audit um, running a few checks and balances before we even came in, um, which really allowed us to bolster the accountability and resource protection measures for, for, for all of that expenditure. So I think all of us, if I say all of us, the ecosystem of accountability, including the AGSA, did better in the floods rather than in the, in, in the COVID era. Um, of course, troubling was the delays and the expenditure, troubling was the delays and the, the responsiveness, uh, but there was some effective spend and time we spend, and there was definitely instances where we saw that uh, resources were being protected. Well, the, the training scheme, which is accredited by the South African Institute of, Institute of Charter Accountants, is pretty much the same training scheme or similar to what you would find at a private firm, any of the big four firms, and, and others. Um, same standards, same benchmarks, same oversight by the Institute. Um, it, it was started more than 20 years ago, um, started pretty small and has grown from strength to strength. Um, where we are now is we offer bursaries for young people who otherwise would not have the opportunity to go and study to be chartered accountant. Um, to go and study either through the bursaries we issue directly or the bursaries we issue through uh, Tutuka, which is a, a profession-wide program, which I think you're well aware of. Yeah. Um, and out of that come individuals who now have the benefit of the academic training from university, having had this opportunity that otherwise would not have had, come into our environment to train for, for the on-the-job training and to still um, get their professional exams done. Um, and as you know, there are two professional exams. A real marker of how we're doing in terms of the quality and the <laughs> input would be how many people qualify as CAs at the end of it. We're now over the 20 years almost at 2,000 individuals that would have, would have qualified through the scheme of AGSA. Now that's 2,000 young people, majority black, African, and majority women. Wow, that's great. And as you know, the statistics in the profession have um, that demographic still relatively under underrepresented, although they're being significant, <coughs> and we've been, you know, a major contributor to it. These are individuals who often are the first graduates in their in their family, first generation. So what it does is it not only helps individuals attain their own um, aspirations, but it does change the lived experience of generations of their families. This much we know, right? Um, I was telling you as we were starting that I met a young woman just on this floor who tells me she passed her board exam and then she, I, she helps me understand what it means. She's, she hasn't even told her family back home in Ngopo yet because she knows just how, how excited they will be. She's still digesting this for herself because she knows it's a big change for her. She can go on and do other things. The program over the last few years has now come to a point where we are contributing in the top two or three in terms of number of new CAs in the profession. So put that simply, we are now standing shoulder to shoulder with our counterparts in the, in the private sector. Cool. Again, that's important for me because you've got to build public institutions that are characterized by real and perceived excellence, right? 
right? Um, so that nobody feels like you are less than because you are or come from the public sector, but rather you're just as good if not better. Um, so that's quite, quite important. Um, our graduates go on to, to do marvelous things. So they become CFOs in the public sector, but many of them go on to the private sector more and more. Um, and more, more and more of them are going overseas. The, the auditors general from different parts of the world, my peers, recruit actively from our office, as does the private sector. Why? Because they understand the excellence that sits here. We could lament and say, oh, but this is a brain drain, you're taking away people who train. We see it as an invitation to do more of this because you transform the lives of individuals, you build capability for the public sector and private sector here, and you give young people the opportunity to shine on the global stage. Um, our guys get phenomenal exposure. They audit municipalities, they audit provincial government, national government departments and entities. State-owned entities were already more and more. So they get experience of the breadth and complexity of the public sector, which really stands in good stead as they build their careers beyond us. If we look at the public sector, what we see is that there are a number of different institutions with different mandates, some operating well, but far too many not operating on their mandate, not being effective on it, not being efficient in the deployment of resources, and not being uh, disciplined in ensuring that they are transparent and accountable uh, with the requisite level of, of consequence management. Um, when we look at the governance arrangements as designed, they cater for that. The question is why? And our sense is that, first of all, you've got to have a professional public service, one where the managers are competent across all levels, where internal audit works well, where audit committee works well, where the accounting officer takes them seriously and is responsive to the matters that are being raised, because that's how you build institutions and institutional strength over time. You've got to have executive authorities that understand their duties and execute on their duties of monitoring, supervision, and support as designed in the legislation. And you've got to have oversight mechanisms, the councils, the municipal, uh, the provincial legislatures, the uh, National Assembly and the ATOP operating effectively on their given mandate. If you get there, you've now got everybody firing on all cylinders in their given mandate. We believe wholeheartedly that that's the trick to building institutions and making sure that they can predictably and consistently de deliver on their mandate. We've got, yes, diminishing resources, and we've got, yes, ever-increasing needs and wants of citizens. The trick is to make sure that you limit wasting, you limit fragmentation, you limit duplication, and you do that by ensuring that everyone on that ecosystem does their bit. Um, and you're not, nobody's um, left to, to, to weaken the side. Um, I would want to see, as I say, a different culture of different players in the ecosystem of accountability doing their, their bit as designed. Um, there's got to be much less tolerance for incompetence, much less tolerance for wrongdoing. Um, there's got to be uh, a much clearer focus on saying, in my corner, I will do what I'm supposed to do. Um, if I look at our strategy, it helps us get there because it says, as AGSA, we have the benefit of auditing everyone every single year. So we get to see the public sector probably in a way that very few people do. Um, we have the ability to give insight that's credible and independent because we're independent of the state. But we also have the ability to reach different players in the ecosystem because we're the ones who talk to accounting officers all the time, we talk to the executive authority all the time, we talk to parliaments all the time. So we've got to use what we know and have gathered through our audits of auditing everyone um, to influence different actions that drive towards the ideal of proper effectiveness by everyone. Um, and where that is failing, we also have the benefit of our powers of enforcement to force people to do what's wrong. So if you look at the example that I gave you about some of the airlines, we're not just seized with chasing financial losses and resource recovery, but we're also saying to accounting officers, you're causing harm here, sort it out. And then we're also saying to them, this is symptomatic of these problems. 
deal with them so that over time you strengthen your institution. So having worked with the team here, we believe that that's a unique and timely and most relevant contribution that we can make as Team HSA with the benefit of independence, with the benefit of capability, which, by the way, South Africans have invested in, right? Because we're funded through audit fees that really come through public funds. Um, our, our preoccupation is on saying, how do we make all of that count for the public service? Um, how can we partner with other players to change the posture and the profile of those that run um, the public institutions?